Hi everybody, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Tom from Workforce Digital um, and today with Anna and Olivia uh, we're going to be discussing um, our approach and how you can adopt some of those approaches to solving tech and IT skill shortages. So as a quick introduction to the business, um, we're a part of Workforce People Solutions, uh, which is almost 15 years old and has placed over 15,000 people in the UK uh, with our unique model. So we support businesses such as the ones below to source the best international talent, to actually relocate them to the UK, but not only to place them, but help those companies retain them on a long-term basis. Unlike a recruitment agency where we'd make a placement and then leave everybody to it, our responsibility goes um, way beyond that. Um, we look to represent um, companies and support them uh, with visas and sponsorships. Whether a company has a sponsorship license or not, we can still support. Uh, and anybody that we um, put forward for any roles have all been video interviewed, tech tested and psychometrically assessed. So as a quick round of introductions, I'm Tom Whiteside. Um, I'm the head of operations here at Workforce Digital. Uh, I've been in recruitment almost 20 years. I've had 10 years, the last 10 years in-house. So working for companies like TK Maxx and the Cooperative Group. And for the last seven years, I've been working with um, um, high growth and startup tech businesses setting up HR recruitment functions. Um, Olivia? Hi, everybody. I don't know if you've seen my video yet on the virtual stand, but if not, I am um, the senior customer manager at... Um, Workforce Digital, and I liaise with all clients within the digital industry. My background is cybersecurity and software. So I've built up knowledge over years within this particular industry. And I look to onboard clients and, and build relationships with them to support them from a recruitment point of view. Over to you, Anna. Hi guys, I'm Anna and I'm working in Workforce uh, Digital as a People and Compliance Manager. I am, um, I am uh, for seven years with the business right now and I started as a resource and then I've uh, been promoted to payroll manager and later on I finished my CIPD qualification and I became People and Compliance Manager. I am responsible of all HR aspects of the business plus all the compliance right to work checks, uh, Brexit, uh, all Brexit related information, plus everything about uh, visas and sponsorship. Okay, thanks Olivia, thanks Anna. So moving on to the, the, the key presentation. So the number one challenge we feel is facing all tech businesses at the moment are skill shortages. So this is new information we've known for years. It's been on the horizon. As mentioned, I've been in tech six, seven years and we, we've been talking about it ever since then. Um, so there's just a few examples from the last three years of um, the FT, Salesforce, Total Jobs, job site, all concluding the same thing that we're, um, we've all got challenges and they're only going to be compounded further um, by Brexit and COVID at the moment. Uh, we've got IR35 and many other I issues rumbling on. Um, and then from the end of this year, um, the end of free movement in Europe um, and that door closes. So um, the challenge is to, to find the talent that you need within the talent pools available. Um, Tech Radar Pro summarised things very recently in a, in a, in a good article, um, again just about the compounded issues within the market in terms of the fact that we have challenges anyway, uh, they get increasingly um, more challenging um, and as it says here at the bottom perhaps most worrying of all is the fact that even before the pandemic started the UK was already seriously struggling to hire talent um, with relevant technology and data science skills. So the first thing we wanted to do um, as in, uh, from an interactive perspective is, is a poll. So um, in a moment, um, I'll hand over to Natasha, who I think is going to flash up a poll on the screen. Um, but what I'd like to ask you is, do you feel that you've exhausted all your tech and IT talent pools, either directly or through your PSL? Are you unsure how to attract and retain the best overseas talent? Unclear about sponsorship licenses, or do you need to boost your diversity and inclusion agenda? Um, or is your growth and demand for tech and IT resource outstripping supply um, potentially coupled with an inflexible low, low return on investment in finding that talent? So I think this is where Natasha comes in. You should be able to see it now. Yeah, so please tick any that apply. Normally give it a good 30 seconds or so and then, um, then I'll show the results to you. Okay, thank you. feel like your glamorous assistant here, Tom. <laughs> well, Not you. so glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason people have glamorous assistants. 
There you go. Okay, we'll give it another 10 seconds or so. So feel free to select all of those that apply to you. Okay. And you should be able to see the results now, Tom. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I can, thank you. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Obviously, there's a little bit of a mix there. Um, the, third, the one that's furthest ahead with about two thirds um, is the, the growth and demand for tech and IT resource outstripping supply. So as mentioned, I've worked in tech startups and rapidly expanding businesses. And that there's always been a challenge to find um, the people that you really feel that you need. So can we flash the poll back up, Natasha? Thank you. Um, so um, so that, there's no real surprise there. Um, and in terms of boosting the DNI agenda, obviously a hot topic for, for a number of years and certainly at the moment with, with everything that's going on um, in the world. Um, so it's great that over half the businesses feel that um, that is in hand. Um, again, by attracting overseas talent, there's an opportunity to boost that because naturally they come from um, diverse backgrounds and different cultures. Um, again, about, about a third unsure how to attract the best overseas talent. So that suggests that two thirds do, which is fantastic. Um, and um, do you feel that you've exhausted your local tech and IT talent pool? Um, so just under half, but um, again, that's no real surprise because it does end up being a merry-go-round. So we're in Greater Manchester and, and being in-house, I've seen that it, can, it just see, it seems to be the same CVs going round and round, um, and it can really drive up salaries and it makes the, the market very, very tight. So that's um, that's very helpful. Uh, thanks, Natasha. Um, so, so moving on from that, um, as a, so why do companies need to look further afield? Why do we need to look globally to attract the talent um, into the UK? So the UK is seen on the, on the global stage as an innovation hub and certainly up there with, with any other country in the world in that respect. But the UK tech and that, we've got well-documented skill shortages. Um, we've got IR35 and obviously that was got um, implications which kick started last year, sorry, the year before and, and are still rumbling on. As mentioned previously, we've got the end of free movement in December from the EU. So it's the 11th hour opportunity to get the best of what Europe has to offer uh, between now and, and the end of December. Saying that, um, even though there are still very good opportunities there in terms of um, talent opportunities, um, the gaps are closing. So rather than nearshoring and, and, and outsourcing the work to um, Eastern European countries, as an example, uh, companies are either onshoring or they're actually opening offices in these countries. Um, and as a result, um, salaries are rising and the, the, those gaps are closing. So actually the standard of living for developers in these countries is improving, as we'll see in a moment on some other slides. There are still some opportunities there to attract people to the UK. Um, we need to um, look uh, further afield to improve access to the to global talent pools, which, which are out there. Uh, and in many cases, they are active talent pools where people from overseas have planned for many years to come to places like Europe or the US or Australia. Um, and it, it's how to access those talent pools and, and attract people to the UK. And also, obviously, by attracting people to the UK, we bring in new ideas, we encourage diversity, and it supports the UK economy and the, the digital sector as a whole. So there's many, many benefits to looking further afield to bring that talent to the UK, uh, rather than looking offshore for the, for, the, for the solutions that the business requires. And um, if we don't do anything, then that will become unsustainable with spiralling costs, um, and um, it, it, we're not expanding our reach as a, as a community. So if we just look at some of the data behind that, um, so this is recent data, all less than 12 months old. Um, so we'll start by looking at Europe and behind, after Germany, we have the, the highest level of software developers and, and tech professionals um, in Europe. Um, after that, um, France has roughly half what we do and then obviously the, the scale slides downwards. But I often think of these next few slides a, a bit like when you're watching an engineering program and you see how tall the Eiffel Tower is until you compare it to the Empire State Building and until you compare that to the Burj Khalifa. And as you'll see in a moment, and um, the numbers look big here, but wait till, wait till we get to see the rest of the world. So again, we've, we've added the UK to this Eastern European graph on the left hand side. Um, and as you can see, the, the number of developers in these Eastern European countries is, is less, um, but there's still opportunities within those countries because the talent is fantastic um, to attract talent from these countries to the UK. Similarly, um, when we compare UK to Asia, um, you'll see that the UK is dwarfed by the likes of um, India uh, in terms of the, the number of developers in that country. Um, but equally, there are other countries in the APAC region where you may want to consider attracting. 
what I cover on here is um, company, um, countries um, such as Nigeria. Um, so, for example, Mark Zuckerberg has invested in um, the country and developing individuals coming out of university uh, as part of a, a project called Angela um, and, and taking the best talent from Nigeria over to, to the US. And again, that's a country I've got experience from of recruiting from previously. So again, looking at that on a global stage. So um, at the moment, there's approximately 24 million software developers in the world. It's expected that within the next five years, that will rise to um, almost 29 million. And um, the APAC region is showing the strongest growth. Uh, Latin America is showing the second. Um, and India uh, will overtake the US um, in the next five years as well. So India as a market is a, is a key market. Um, in terms of statistics, I, I've read that there's up to 5 million software developers in India. And um, as I mentioned earlier on, many of which are a good example of those that would consider moving to the likes of the UK, US or Australia. And um, if we look at the number of graduates coming out of university per year in various countries um, around the world, um, you'll see the UK down there at the bottom with 75,000 and um, a couple of other countries as examples. But when you compare that to China and India, then, uh, then clearly the, the, there's opportunities um, within that. There is some sensitivity around China at the moment for various um, reasons, um, but, um, but again, the, the, there are certainly opportunities um, in, in other countries globally. Um, this is quite an interesting uh, graph that one of our in-house um, um, people put together. So the red dots that you can see, see here is the national minimum wage for the respective country, and the orange dot is the average IT and technology salary for that country. Uh, converted into, into pounds. But you'll see it over on the right hand side, the countries like the Ukraine, India, Romania, Hungary, they, they've got a relatively um, small gap between um, sort of average and national minimum wages and the premium you might expect somebody in IT or technology to command. So as a result of that, these markets are, are worth considering because if people are looking for better lives themselves and their families and opportunities on a global basis, then um, the UK would certainly be a good option in that respect. To reflect what we're saying earlier, I was saying earlier, the likes of Poland, you'll see that the gap between um, Poland and the UK are, are comparable. So again, then the opportunities and the standard of living in Poland are, are catching up. Um, and then as you get into countries like the US and Germany, um, obviously they're commanding a, a premium in those countries and they've got a very high standard of living. So there may be less opportunity from countries like that. China is a, a little bit different here because the average salary or the national minimum wage, national minimum wages among the lowest, uh, but the, the the IT salaries are among the highest. So obviously there's a, there's a huge difference there that um, we need to factor in. So time for our second poll. Um, so in terms of um, sponsorship licenses, um, I'd like to find out if you do have a sponsorship license and you use it. If you do have a sponsorship license but you don't use it. And um, if you don't have a sponsorship license, but you're in the process of applying for one, you don't have one and you don't have any plans or you don't know. Give it another 10 seconds or so. Thank you. Hopefully my doorbell won't ring this time. I think it was that you. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think we had a doorbell. <laughs> <laughs> Next door neighbours uh, delivery. <laughs> Come a postman in uh, lockdown as well. Okay, I'll end that now and you should be able to see the results. Okay, great. Thank you. So quite, quite a mix really. Um, so the interesting, one of the interesting stats I learned recently is that only 3% of UK businesses actually have a sponsorship license uh, and from the 1st of January and um, whether um, somebody's moving from Poland or Thailand and um, they'll have to come through the same points based system which Anna will introduce you to in a moment I'll tell you more about in a moment due to some recent changes so it is interesting that a fifth of company or fifth of the attendees um, have got um, access to these talent pools and um, it's also very interesting because we, we already know that the 3% of UK businesses that have a license they don't necessarily use them and if they do, they don't always optimise them. There's obviously a good, good intention there, but whether it's actually used is, is a different matter. Um, and then obviously there's a couple of um, there where we're not sure. Um, so that's, that's great. Thanks, Natasha. 
Oh, sorry, that's me. I'm, <laughs> so um, I'm just going to hand over to Anna now, um, who's our People and Compliance Manager. Uh, hi. Uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, I'm Anna, and I'm going to talk a bit more about changes to UK immigration system. As Tom mentioned before, uh, there is a change in uh, immigration coming uh, at the end of the year or from the 1st of January 2021. So the free movement will going to end uh, at the end of this year and we're going to be replaced by new point based system where the points will going to be awarded for things like job, salary and language requirement. The new immigration rules will going to apply to both EU and non EU workers and every employer will going to need to have sponsorship license to be able to start or continue to hire people from outside of the UK. EU nationals currently living in UK will need to obtain something which is called status under EU settlement scheme uh, to be able to legally live and work in UK. More info about our EU settlement scheme you can find uh, in a video or content on our virtual stand. Uh, what are the main changes to the current... Yeah, slide back, thank you. <laughs> what are the main changes to the current immigration system? Um, there are a few different ways to bring talent to the UK. Uh, however, right now, the most popular one is the tier to general visa. And that route will gonna be now named uh, skilled worker uh, visa. And you will gonna be able to bring candidates to UK on that skilled worker license. That skilled worker route, route as mentioned before, will gonna apply to all non-UK nationals who would like to come and work in UK. The good news is that skilled worker route will not gonna have a cap on the number of people who can come to UK. Uh, as before, through the visa route there, it is still a cap of 20,700 applicant, applicants per year. You, another good news is that the new system, uh, the new point-based system, will gonna need to have residence life, uh, labor market test in place. So you will not gonna need to advertise your vacancy for 28 days before uh, trying to find that person overseas on a sponsorship license. Um, also, under MAC recommendations, the general salary thresholds will going to be lowered and from £30,000 it will going to be lowered to £25,600 or the going rate for profession. And one of the last changes to the system will going to be the recommendation on the skills threshold. It will not going to be RQF level 6 anymore, which is uh, equivalent to bachelor's degree. It will going to be RQF level, two, uh, level uh, 3, which is A level. Next slide, thank you. What is that point-based system? So generally, you just need uh, the candidates who are coming to UK need to score a minimum of 70 points. And they have 50 points which are granted as a mandatory, and they can also have 20 tradable points. For what the points are, are um, scored for. So what the candidate has to have, they have to have a op job offer from an approved sponsor, and they were going to have 20 points for that. They were going to need to have a job offer at appropriate skill level, RQF 3+, plus. so that's another 20 points. And they were going to need to speak English at required level, which will going to be set up as an intermediate, intermediate, intermediate level, uh, which is B1. And also then later on, they were going to have extra 20 points, and they can have it for either the salary, which is either 25,600 or the going rate, whichever is higher. Uh, or they can gain 20 points for job in a shortage occupation, which I'm going to talk about uh, on the next slide. They can also have 20 points for PhD in STEM subject or 10 points for PhD in a subject relevant to the job. What is that shortage occupation list? So this is a list of, of occupation which cannot be filled locally, which cannot be filled in UK, uh, by the skilled workers. So where there is a shortage and where, is the, when, where there is a gap uh, on the market, you can then use a uh, shortage occupation list and you can uh, get workers from shortage occupation list currently and bring them to UK on sponsorship license. What will gonna happen, what, or, what already happened a couple of uh, weeks ago, that list has been uh, expanded and you can find a lot of IT roles on the list. Uh, so those IT uh, roles will gonna gain additionally 20 points for list to position on that, uh, for the position, uh, position on that shortage occupation list. Additionally, people who will gonna come to UK from that shortage occupation list 
we're going to benefit from lower visa fees. So that's uh, uh, that's another benefit of the trade being on that short preparation. Uh, that's all from me for now. And uh, I would like to hand over uh, to Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. So just to reiterate, um, we have got more information on this on our virtual stand in the video section. And um, we've also this morning added the updated shortage occupation list to the download section on our stand as well. And so you can find that there. OK, so what I want to cover at this point is looking at the top half of um, this page and compared to the bottom half. So the top half um, could be seen as a, a typical recruitment process, the internal route. And if you start with a point of offer about a third of the way along on the top section, you can see that's the point at which the offer is made. So backtracking from that to, into the red section, and um, there's a vacancy brief or the point at which the vacancy is identified, and then the internal recruitment team and whatever processes you would usually adopt would, would go through the usual processes of advertising, searching, interviewing, assessing, and um, getting to a verbal offer. If you're adding visas and sponsorship to that, then again, that will be part of that process and, and, and doing everything that's required for that. The danger, especially in the talent short market, is that you go round and round in circles and you, you, you can even get to the point of offer and you might have had two interviews and tech tests and various other points throughout that journey. And that candidate can get counter offered or they feel they've had a better offer elsewhere. Um, and all of a sudden you're back to square one. So here I've said minus four to minus eight weeks, but this could be months. We've, we've all been in situations where we've got vacancies that have been open for, for months um, and, and that can just go round and round in circles, a bit of a vicious circle. Um, at the point of actual offer, once you've got some commitment from the candidate, then they're usually on a two or a 12 week notice. Uh, and then they would, they would start further down the line on these sort of aquamarine, turquoise, green, um, these green points. Of course, if somebody's on 12 weeks notice, which a lot of people in tech will be these days, you could get to week eight. And again, they might still be actively in the market. They might let you down at the last minute. They could get counter offered. They, they, lots of things can happen. There's lots of risk even after they've accepted the offer. And if anything happens during that notice period, you're back to square one. So potentially you've lost months and months. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a cycle um, that you can go round and round. Um, obviously, if everything's working great and you've got a great employer brand and you've, you've applied lots of tools and techniques that a lot of the other um, presenters have um, suggested today, then that can all help. But ultimately, all these things can be very real challenges. Looking at um, a visa approach to it, and it, the process is usually a lot more linear. Your starting point here is, is, a, is a much larger target audience and a much larger talent pool. And it, it's not unlimited, but there's, there's certainly a lot more to, to, um, to go at. So you, the, if you get the process right um, from the vacancy brief up to the point of offer, actually it's much more linear and um, we've highlighted in here on the bottom section some of the things that we add to that process which again can give that reassurance when looking at overseas talent so adding video interviews adding a tech test doing psychometric assessments comparing that to your in-house competency and value frameworks and and that can really help to again streamline that process in the early days but to be good at the visas and be good at the sponsorship and that side of things, then not only do you need these tools, you also need to have the training on them or to have external help, which again, adds, adds to everything from a cost perspective. And so, um, but if you get it right, then it, it's a much more linear process. And often when somebody's uh, moving from overseas, they made that decision many years ago um, and um, you're helping them to facilitate that process. Uh, and so the chances of, counter offers and alternative offers, especially once they've made a financial commitment to a visa, it's very unlikely that that, that candidate will, will change their mind or, or back out of the process. So at the point of offer on the bottom process, if you do the fast track visa option uh, within a couple of weeks, um, depending on the time of the month when you, you actually make the offer, um, you could be formalizing offers because all the visa aspects have been taken care of. They then serve their notice and relocate to the UK. Um, and all of that can potentially be a lot quicker than just a typical UK notice period. So overseas talent can often be seen as a challenge and a risk and with inherent difficulties. And yes, there are, but if you're aware of those and you manage them effectively, then there's a real opportunity there to um, add some value to the, to the team from a diversity perspective, from an ideas perspective, from an innovation perspective. It really opens things up um, in, a, in a big way. So just to summarise and sort of bring that together. So um, it, it, if you look at the centre of the triangle in terms of your employer brand, certainly your online presence, especially in the current market, especially on a global scale, because that can often be what um, individuals will base their impression of that business. 
um, blast all of it or hate it. I mean, you've got YouTube that's mentioned in a previous presentation, having a presence on there, just giving employers, employees or potential employees a real insight into to what it's actually like to work for your business. Having your defined UK processes. So there's not any much point in looking overseas if you've not de defined and, and cemented your UK processes and got those working because this is to supplement that rather than to, to replace it. And, and you need to get that right in the first place. And because of the volume and because of the compliance element of it, and then really you need good systems in place. And again, there's been people presenting today, ATSs and HR management software and platforms and compliance platforms. This really does need to be in place in order for you to manage that effectively. But on the basis that that is in place, then what you then need is, is the outer part of this triangle, which is effective workforce planning. If you know, um, if you're lucky enough to know three to six months in advance, what your requirements are and you can work backwards from that start date that you've got data based on recruiting for these types of roles before and um, that you know your time to hire and even the likeliness to hire if you need a data scientist or an infosec specialist in six weeks and you, you, you're putting a few adverts out there and doing a bit of linkedin networking are you realistically going to find the people you need do you need to be thinking a little bit differently do you need to reach out to the to the global market and um, so it, that workforce planning is trying to be as proactive as possible and preempting and, and future requirements. On the basis you've done that, um, you need to obtain the license, um, but also you need to understand it. And so, and there's lots of companies out there that can support you with that, um, including ourselves, but um, usually legal firms that would support you with that. Uh, and there is online training that you can have to help um, build the confidence with the team and make it seem a little bit less, um, a little bit less strange and alien. Um, and then on that basis, you're then looking to attract and assess the tech and IT talent, which is done remotely. So this year might actually act as a bit of a, um, a bit of a dress, dress rehearsal for that working remotely and assessing candidates. And I started a job earlier on in the year uh, and didn't actually go into the office once um, as a contract. So, so the world in some ways is, is like that, but, but ultimately we are working towards uh, working together again and being collaborative and, and being in a room and, the whites of the eyes and all those kind of things. So once you once you go out to market, then you need to be able to map and understand your target markets and use the appropriate messaging in order to, to attract people and then and then decide how you're going to assess those people remotely and um, because they will be moving to the UK specifically to work for you. Um, you may also, as a sideline, wish to consider how you would support them um, with that, that relocation. Um, and um, considerations around housing and um, bank accounts and national insurance numbers and, and that's supplementary support they would need to set up a life in the UK for themselves and their dependents. So I'm just going to hand over to Olivia. Thanks Tom. So now this part of the presentation is an opportunity for us to reflect and just walk through some of the main areas that we've already discussed. So what does good recruitment business continuity look like in order to grow a successful tech workforce? Firstly, you need to make sure you've got a planned approach when sourcing talent with a specialist set of skills. I recognise within the digital industry how important it is to bring individuals with different skills together, especially when adopting the agile methodology within certain projects. Number two, the end of free movement. This is the topic on everybody's lips, or it should be. Ask yourselves, are you proactively looking to take this opportunity to relocate EU talent between now and January? And the final point, during this presentation, we've only just scratched the surface for you when it comes to visa sponsorship licenses and the points-based immigration system. But are you going to take time to research and not miss out on being able to recruit talent internationally moving forward? Now we're going to recap the challenges. Number one, I know that our audience will understand the importance of employee well-being, but not everyone is fortunate enough to have invested into a HR fu function, or they may not have had the time yet if they're a startup business focused purely on product innovation. Your recruitment process could be robust, but are you able to retain this talent long term? Number two, Brexit. I know that daily conversations are not as, impact, not as apparent anymore because COVID took over, but this is still an underlying issue and the IT and skills shortages within the UK could only be getting worse. So are you equipped to make sure 
that you will be in a position to onshore talent and it is still feasible in 2021. I'd also like to make an interesting point, actually. I heard it from the MD of entrepreneurship of, at NatWest, and he said that tech businesses will be central to the U UK's economic recovery following the COVID-19 pandemic. This really struck home with me and it highlights even further how crucial the demand really will be for the digital industry. And finally, I'm personally overwhelmed by this final start of 3% and it leads me smoothly into what a lack of action could cause uh, the industry. So companies will no doubt need a boost for their DNI agenda, but how will this be obtained if you're not prepared to onshore talent? Number two, of course, you are looking at financial consequences, which could cripple some companies within the digital industry. It's very important to, to obviously look at that and companies are looking at that all of the time. So how can we move forward out of the COVID times and, and grow financially through uh, the, having the right key people in place. And finally, in order to innovate, it is extremely important that those specialist skills across IT and tech are being obtained, whether that be, you know, local talent or international talent is a real focus area that we've been carrying a lot of research um, within. So this, um, this final slide of mine, I've certainly found that our industry is shifting towards full relocation opposed to offshoring and nearshoring uh, talent. I've been having these conversations with CTOs and they really are seeing the value in onshoring that talent when it cannot be obtained from uh, locally. So we've been understanding our industry to not only see how we can add value immediately, but longer term to support them through their growth process. So how do we do that? Tom alluded to it before. We support them through the full relocation process. We pick them up from the airport. We uh, have a network of landlords where we will assist the candidates with housing. We'll set up bank appointments. But in order to prove to our clients and evidence that we are getting the best talent, we actually uh, tech test them and we carry out psychometric tests as well and Zoom interviews to make sure it's that, that it's the full, uh, robust recruitment model. Okay, thanks, Lavia. Pleasure. Right. Um, so um, just to wrap things up, um, just a quick overview of the team that we have here uh, within the business. Um, so Workforce People Solutions is 15 years old um, and digital is here to, to solve many of the current issues with, as a, as a, as a sub-brand of, of the wider business. And if you head over to our stand, uh, we've got a range of downloads, a range of videos, and um, you can meet the team. We've got two international recruiters who've come from India and Poland and themselves, and we're talking about their own personal experiences and how they can add value in that respect. Uh, and also, as mentioned earlier, there's more information on Brexit uh, and the EU, the EU settlement, if you need more information on that. Um, and that's it from us. So if you'd like to speak to us at any point, you feel free to visit the stand or get in touch.